Uh, but welcome to everybody. Uh, next week we have uh, our, our what will be our first uh, alumni visiting professor, um, who will be our uh, honored Stephen Brick uh, alumni uh, visiting professor. We have uh, Dr. Eric Edmonds, who trained here um, with many of us and is now uh, one of the faculty, does uh, pediatric sports medicine at uh, Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. So he not only was faculty here, but ended up being uh, attending for some of our uh, folks who trained out there. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Um, we have a uh, lab arranged for Wednesday night with him and will we'll include dinner. Um, so hopefully uh, we can get some uh, RSVPs from that uh, quickly because we got to give them numbers for dinner. Uh, unfortunately, we did it at a time where all the sports fellows are out of town. So uh, it'll just be residents. Um, See me color for today is going to be silver, and we will uh, otherwise get going with grand rounds. Um, our first presenter is going to be Dr. Posey, who is going to try and put us all to sleep. I mean, talk to us about coagulation. <laughs> You're going to love it. I checked. He did good. We're unmuted. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Lou Posey, one of the fourth year residents at CMC. Today, I'm gonna share with you some of my original research on the coagulation cascade and uh, put Julia to sleep, but really talk about why we all need to understand it. Only disclosure, instead of the usual military jargon, because I know the Air Force doesn't care, is that I am a nerd. And again, most of my research in medical school is in a coagulation lab. So in orthopedics, we take care of the injured. In these level one trauma resuscitations, there can be a lot of blood loss, and there's the ultimate goal of creating this fiber and mesh work to stop the bleed. The ultimate and non-functioning coagulation system can cause inappropriate blood loss, and meanwhile, an overactive coagulation system can cause pulmonary embolism. And finally, it is well known that infectious bacteria such as staph and streptococcal infections, for example, can hijack this system to help with its dissemination. And as we learned from Dr. Hysong's necrotizing fasciitis talk, can help aid in their dissemination throughout the body. So we can all agree that understanding coagulation is important uh, to orthopedic surgeons and nearly every medical field. And we can divide the entire system into three parts, how to make a clot, how to dissolve a clot, and even how it fits into the overall systemic picture for a patient. And aligning these categories into clinically oriented topics, they each discuss an important topic from hemorrhage and thrombosis to tissue regeneration, and even in the cases of infection and cancer. So today we focus on making a clot. And this is the picture Julia sees in her brain when she hears this. And we all start thinking of this to have PTSD back in medical school. But really this ca cascade that was originally developed was only meant for monitoring warfarin. It's actually not the clinical picture of how coagulation works. And so that begs the question, what is a clinical model? Ideally, a clinical model will balance anatomy and physiology in a way that's easy to understand, remember, and therefore assist in making clinical decisions. This is an SR-71 engine for a Blackbird. I didn't pick this out because it's my cadet squadron. I just think it's a really cool engine. And while it looks very complex, it really serves a very simple purpose. And that's also similar for the coagulation system. So looking at our engine, Typically, we take air to create thrust. In the setting of the coagulation engine, we are taking fibrinogen to make fiber. And thus, coagulation's primary purpose is to transform this inactive fibrinogen into functional fibrin, and that's simple enough, but it begs the question, what's going on on the inside for the combustion engine? So to answer that, let's focus in on a blood vessel. This is a blood vessel at baseline, uninjured. We have all these coagulation factors floating around, but no clots that are forming, which is great. And in, if there is an inciting event, such as trauma, infection, or even surgery, that damages the endothelium that can expose the subendothelial cells and promote the spark or damage that can lead uh, thrombin to be converted into prothrombin into thrombin. And once we have active thrombin, that's what converts fibrinogen into fibrin. So remembering this coagulation engine, one inciting event isn't enough to keep an engine going. It takes cyclical combustion. And so in this setting, we're going to go through what also gives it the gas, which is platelets. <laughs> 
And coming back to our vessel, we have that spark that converts prothrombin into thrombin and then fibrinogen into fibrin. And thus we have role number one of thrombin, which again is just to create fibrin. But there is this secondary role of thrombin when it is generated, where it also activates nearby platelets. And on the surface of this activated platelet, it can activate more thrombin, set off that uh, positive cascade that ultimately creates even more thrombin, more platelets, and whatever is needed to re respond to that damage. And ultimately, this is what lays down your fibrin meshwork intravascularly. And then interestingly enough, a lot of studies have shown that 90% of the fibrin is actually deposited extravascularly, which is why we see those drops in fibrin just for the clinically ill patients. And so from this model, we can kind of break this down to a simple equation of coagulation, which is injured tissue multiplied by platelet ampl amplification produces continuous thrombin formation, or a spark times platelets equals a controlled explosion of thrombin. If we decrease platelet amplification, what happens to thrombin formation? It decreases, you have a hypocoagulable state. For a patient with systemic inflammatory illness, making them more likely to spark after a relative injury, that patient is gonna generate, generate a greater spark and multiplied by platelets will be hypercoagulable. But now we need to look at the anatomy and physiology of what is occurring at the cellular level. In the words of our late chief, Dr. Brad Young, let's get back to the science. <laughs> so here we will introduce the concept of coagulation complexes and how they are essential in understanding physiology and the pathology of coagulation. This is kind of like taking the smaller portion of this SR-71 engine, such as the fuel injector or the exhaust valve. So coming back to our vessel, we will dive down into this area of the exposed subendothelium, where we had our spark that generated prothrombin to thrombin. And let's look at that cellular level, what's going on. <clears throat> really, on that injured cell surface are four main elements for the coagulation engine. <clears throat> on the cell surface, you have an anchoring cofactor, and activating protease. And then the ultimate name of it is what it's serving to do. Extrinsic tenase is meant to make activated factor 10. So zooming out slightly <coughs> on this cell, we see that when a cell is injured, it expresses tissue factor on its surface, which is our coagulation complex anchor, grabs factor seven and creates the extrinsic tenase. This is our first example of the coagulation complex. And again, this is actually the spark that we were talking about that converts prothrombin into thrombin. And thrombin, therefore, cleaves fibrinogen into fibrin. And that's what we know for the, quote, extrinsic pathway when we look at it from a laboratory standpoint. But we also know thrombin serves the role of activating platelets. And there's coagulation complexes on the surface of platelets as well. And there is where we have our intrinsic tenase, which, again, serves the same function of making fa activated factor 10. And then it also interacts with a prothrombinase complex to convert prothrombin into thrombin. What's the main difference between these two is really just the efficiency of the system. The platelets, when they are activated, are about seven times more effective at creating thrombin than the injured cell. And ultimately, it can convert more fibrinogen into fibrin. So coagulation is really just a combination of the injured cell and platelet amplification at its baseline. And why do you really care about all this at the cellular level is you really don't, but it helps tie in some of the pharmacology and what we hear about and why things work the way they do. So how do you turn off the engine? Using our equation as a guide, we have three different areas we can attack. We can either, either stop it at the production of thrombin, stop it at platelet amplification, or try to prevent injured tissues, which we'll kind of talk about. So focusing on the main point in terms of where thrombin comes into the engine is really just how do you turn off as you extinguish the flame. And that's where antithrombin comes in. And that's what we naturally have in our bodies to act at both the prothrombinase and extrinase tom, uh, portion where that all coincides at thrombin. So it binds to thrombin as a suicide inhibitor that prevents fibrinogen from being converted to fibrin. And the reason I'm bothering telling you about that is that's how heparin really works. Heparin acts as a catalyst for this entire process, makes it work uh, much more efficiently at binding to thrombin in a dose-dependent manner. 
And then the clinical relevance in terms of the question I've always gotten is, well, when do we stop the heparin before surgery? I feel like you hear this in various degrees and it's all, you know, person dependent. The half-life of heparin in its IV form is about an hour to an hour and a half. Usually after four to five half-lives, most of it's out of the system in terms of what would be clinically relevant. So really in about four to six hours. And so that's the discussion on heparin and where it works at the thrombin portion of formation. Another way to attack this would be at the platelet amplification stage. So going back to our model, that would be really just denying it the gas to run. And that just allows an engine when you don't have gas to just burn out on its own. And ultimately that's where low molecular weight heparin comes in. So again, it's really working the same way with antithrombin as a catalyst, it's just smaller as the name implies of low molecular weight heparin. And it actually specifically binds more to the 10A on the prothrombinase complex, functioning more as a way to shut down the platelet amplification state. And again, that's just size dependent on how that's done. So it catalyzes antithrombin, inhibiting 10A. It has a half-life of three to four hours. Oh, sorry. So in terms of patients for the OR, that would be in about 12 to 16 hours that most of it is out of the system. Now let's turn to the final way our body can shut down coagulation, and that's the injured tissue pathway. Obviously, we can't prevent all the sparks. Anytime there's trauma, anytime there's surgery, there's going to be injury. Um, but there is a way to think about the tissue factor pathway inhibitor that our body can naturally express. So we've already set the precedent of our extrinsic pathway on the injured cell. And on its surface, tissue factor is what is expressed as the cofactor on the cell surface. But if I were to tell you there's a way to induce tissue factor pathway inhibitor, which is a molecule that will bind to this tissue factor and ultimately shut off the spark. And in summary, this stops coagulation before it starts in a dose-dependent way. And really, that's one of the ways that sequential compression devices work from a mechanism of action. We've all no Verkaus triad and how it helps with venous stasis, but anytime healthy endothelium is squeezed, it, it releases a small dose of tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And so that's one of the other theorized reasons that SEDs work. So to review, this is the third way that the body prevents coagulation and it can dampen the response. And there are even more complex cases that we could discuss. And that's when you get into the matter of using Coumadin we know about all the factors that we had to memorize for our board exams that it can inhibit and how essentially it acts at every single portion of the coagulation engine in our model to include protein C and S, which are the anticoagulants factors. And we do know that it affects them first, which is why we've always been classically told to bridge Coumadin for those patients when you're starting them back on it. So as we begin to wrap up our discussion, let's think about what categories of coagulopathic patients, orthopedic patients can fall into. We have plenty of reasons for injury, spanning from trauma to infection, surgery, and cancer. And then depending on their clinical state, they can consume many of their anticoagulant factors in uh, the ICU setting. Ultimately, I need to thank Courtney Baker and Dr. Schoenecker for a lot of their help with this talk and influence throughout my career. They're always a lot of fun and a lot of uh, good discussions in the lab for how all this works. And I know Julia's not asleep yet, so she would have loved those conversations as well. I always have to thank my class and hear the references. Thank you very much. I'll stop the <coughs> questions. Um, great, great talk. For practical purposes, we're also doing a lot with aspirin, Eliquis. Um, What's your recommendation for stopping those before surgery? Yeah, great question. Um, in terms of the aspirin, we know that it's an irreversible inhibitor. So it's going to last your platelets regenerate about seven to nine days. So typically, if you really don't want that antiplatelet effect, it'd be about a week. For a lot of the more like new direct inhibitors of 10A, Eliquis being the more common one I'm seeing uh, for a lot of patients with AFib that we're taking care of. Um, its half-life is about 12 hours. So clinically, for those four to five half-lives to be out, it's really the recommendation is dependent on how severe the injury is. And some of the some of these studies that have been done 
if you're being really conservative, it would be at least two to three days before surgery. Um, if it's a more minor procedure, they say just one day. But they've even done a lot of the prospective trials that have looked at that have actually been the, as usual for medicine in the uh, cardiac literature, not so much the orthopedic literature. So it's been for a lot of the patients with valves. And the bridge trial, like getting into that with warfarin, like, so if you tie that to warfarin, they only recommend stopping warfarin five days before surgery to get to an effective INR below 1.2. So you may have had it in there, but my brain was sort of exploding, like a little popcorn in the microwave as that was happening. Um, tell us about the TXA and where does that fit into this process and, and yeah. how, how does that help us as surgeons? Yeah, so all of this was about just making the clock. Uh, it, TXA really comes into the fact of breaking the clock down. Um, and so it acts on plasma as a, and ultimately, I think one of the big misconceptions for TXA is that it makes you pro, like it's hypercoagulable is kind of what I've heard as the misnomer. It really just stabilizes clots that are already there. And so it's been a game changer, obviously, clinically in the arthroplasty world and many of our higher, what we would call as higher risk uh, procedures for heavy bleeding and uh, spine as well. And it's big deformity correction. But in terms of this talk and where it comes in, it would really be a discussion of like fibrinolysis and that whole pathway. So after you make that fibrin mesh work that we kind of showed with the thing exploding out uh, extravascularly, TXA comes into play for the intravascular, which is only 10% of that fibrin mesh work. It just stabilizes whatever.